Good day and welcome to our lesson on interrupts, encoders, and Arduinos. This is prepared for the British Columbia Institute of Technology, Technology Teacher Education 4010 class in April of 2020. There's many excellent videos about uh, encoders and Arduinos and motor control systems uh, that are out there on the internet already. So go ahead and give it a Google uh, and check out YouTube. This is specific to a particular application that I have in mind for today's class uh, dealing with uh, Tinkercad and how it interprets interrupts, encoders, and our Arduino. But before we get there, let's take a look at the many different types of encoder that are available. So chances are you've used an encoder in some way or the other. If you've used a digital caliper, the digital caliper actually has wiring embedded into this main shaft right here that creates tiny little capacitors in conjunction with a circuit board inside the uh, display right here. And that gives you a capacitive linear because it works in a line absolute encoder absolute means that it knows the point that it begins at so when you turn it back on it knows it's at 1.4554 inches so an absolute encoder is one that knows uh, where it is the instant that you turn it on now our incremental encoders they can only tell you how far they've traveled from the time that you turn them on. So they don't know whether they're starting at zero or starting at 100, whether the shaft is at five degrees or at 90 degrees. But this is a magnetic rotational incremental quadrature encoder. So the quadrature encoder is something we're going to talk about a bit later. But there's two sensors right inside here. So as the magnets rotate around, one of the sensors will trigger just ever so slightly before the other sensor. And that enables you to determine the direction of travel of that wheel. So a quadrature encoder can determine the direction of travel, whereas a simple encoder with a single output can only determine the speed and uh, the um, uh, not, and the distance of travel. It can't tell you which direction you traveled in, but it can tell you how many revolutions that you've done or how many ticks have gone past. And certainly, if uh, you're old enough to have used the old style ball mice uh, before everything went over to optical mice, uh, you've definitely used optical rotational incremental quadrature encoders because that wheel or sorry that ball would pop inside and it would roll against the little shaft and you would have your x encoder right here and your y encoder right over here and uh, they had a little uh, little discs that would spin they'd uh, there'd be a roller right there it'd be connected to a shaft and uh, just a little further down there would be a disc it would have light on one side and a sensor on the other side two sensors actually because it was a quadrature encoder so it could tell forwards and backwards and as that wheel spun back and forth you would see the um, the mouse move about on your screen because it was calculating the movement of the ball which translated to the movement of the mouse across the desk so an optical encoder is a pretty common type of thing that we like to use and basically uh, it consists of an optical encoder disk and uh, you can make your own encoder disk if you want uh, if you've got good tools for it because uh, all it is is a whole bunch of slots in a piece of opaque material and you can use a little device like this where it transmits uh, you've got an LED on one side transmitting light directly into either a photodiode or a phototransistor on the other side and as that disk uh, spins around the the little slots go past here and they interrupt the flow the beam of light and they cause your photodiode or phototransistor to switch between a high and a low state and you get a data signal that comes out here that you can go back to your arduino and uh, you can measure that any microcontroller could be able to do that and in fact some non-microcontroller devices are also pretty good at doing it uh, you can also get a reflective setup, which is sometimes a good thing if you're just trying to figure out the RPM of a piece of equipment in your shop. You can put a piece of black tape, for instance, on, uh, on a lathe chuck or uh, on a drill chuck, and you can put a, uh, a reflective sensor on here. And as that black tape comes along, 
it will stop the reflection off of the shiny chuck and you will see a change in light. The only catch is that usually these reflective sensors, you have to hold them pretty close within a couple of millimeters unless you've got a highly focused one. And so you've got to be pretty precise and pretty careful about how you hold it on there. But you can add a reflective sensor into a lot of circuits uh, systems more easily. Not everything has to be a magnetic or uh, optical. Uh, I remember one time when we were building a robot for the first robotics competition, we just needed a quick, simple, dirty uh, encoder to determine how far one of our winches was traveling. So we hot glued uh, little half pieces of dowel onto the outside of the winch and put a switch on it so that every time a little half piece of dowel went by, it would throw the switch and we'd get this lovely tick, 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 tick sound as the winch went up or down. And every time the switch went tick, uh, our, um, uh, our robot's brain unit would record that. So that was what we call a simple encoder. And simple encoders only have one sensor. And so they can measure speed and uh, distance, but they can't measure direction. And I stole this little image right off of Wikipedia. So I'd like to give credit for that. Uh, they can't measure the direction, though, because uh, really you this signal looks the same whether I'm going this way or whether I'm going this way. I could mirror that uh, symbol around and it would look identical in either direction. So you can't tell which direction that square wave is going. However, if you look at the frequency, how often you go, uh, how long it takes to go from leading edge to leading edge, okay, uh, it, or the number of leading edges you get per second would be your frequency. The uh, pulse time would be how long it takes to go from top to bottom. Either way, they're the inverse of each other. Uh, that can tell you how fast your wheel is spinning. And if you take a look at the number of pulses that go past, that will tell you how far the wheel has spun. So a simple encoder, just like that uh, single switch that we put onto our winch uh, back uh, over a decade ago, uh, can work really well if you just need a quick and dirty way to measure how far something has spun. And it doesn't always have to be rotational either. Uh, you could take a grating and you could slide it back and forth horizontally and have it uh, trigger beams of light or trigger a switch and you would have a, a linear encoder. So fairly easy to do. Now quadrature encoders are pretty much the industry standard or the normal thing. If you go out and ask somebody for an encoder, chances are you're probably going to get a quadrature encoder. And uh, that's a really fancy name for saying, uh, yeah, we're giving you two, two sensors. And you're going to have sensor A and sensor B. Now, the beautiful thing about a quadrature encoder is, of course, you can use it as just a simple encoder. So if you only look at channel A, then you can measure the pulse length. OK, so you can figure out your speed. And uh, if you only count the pulses, you can travel how far you've gone. You don't have to do anything with channel B. What channel B does that's really useful is that it comes along right here and channel B will go high right here. So if channel B is high when channel A gets triggered, then you're moving in this direction. But if your wheel or your um, slide is spinning in the other direction and it's coming from over here towards over here, then you'll see that A will trigger right here. You'll have a rising slope on A while B is still low. So what that means is that by just monitoring channel A, okay, channel A can trigger your interrupts that we'll talk about in just a minute. Well, when you trigger that interrupt on channel A, you just take a look at the state of channel B. And if B is high, you're traveling in one direction. And if you're coming this way, then B will be low and you're traveling in the other direction. So a quadrature encoder enables you to determine uh, all three things that you'd want to know. Uh, your distance based on the number of pulses, your speed based on how frequent, how frequent those pulses happen, and you can determine your direction by taking a look at the second channel. And if B is high, then you add a tick. And if B is low, then you subtract a tick as you go past. Now, the thing about doing that is that you've got to be quick. Okay, so 
the way we're going uh, to take a look at doing this, uh, your encoders say it's got 50 slots on it and it's spinning at 200 RPM. That's going to give you 10,000 pulses per minute, 167 pulses per second, or six milliseconds per pulse. Now, as you remember, each pulse has a high segment and a low segment. So you're looking at three milliseconds of high and three milliseconds of low. Now, if you want to know your speed within 1%, you'd want to be able to measure that pulse time to within about 1% too. So now you're getting down to 30 microseconds or 30 millionths of a second, which to your average average human is faster than we can push a stopwatch on and off, unless you've had like four cups of coffee. Uh, but thankfully, even a relatively slow Arduino runs at 16 megahertz or 16 million cycles per second. So it takes about three to five microseconds to execute a simple command. And I uh, stole this from a post that somebody would made on the Arduino form. And you can see right here the typical timing in microseconds of commands inside your Arduino. And so an analog read actually takes a long time because you have to wait for capacitors to stabilize and the analog digital conversion to take place. But something like a digital read, um, three, four microseconds, uh, there's direct reads that we haven't dealt with a lot. Serial print takes a long time because that's a whole series of bits that needs to be passed out there. So some of those start to take a long time. But if you're just uh, doing a little bit of math or setting a pin state, you know, we're talking a few microseconds to have it happen. So being able to measure something down to the nearest 30 millionth of a second, yeah, not a problem for your typical Arduino. And in order to make that happen, we're going to use interrupts because although your Arduino can do it, if you write slow or clunky code, then it's, uh, it's just not going to be able to handle measuring them. So interrupts are a way that you can really improve the efficiency of your code by having all of the counting take place in the background. So you can focus on writing your code and you can say, hey, Arduino, here's a separate set of code. Uh, just, you know, do this whenever uh, whenever you see that pulse go high. And we're going to take a look at that in more detail. I like to compare it uh, to interrupts to being what goes on in your class. Now, the first thing you have to do is you have to enable interrupts. OK, so at the beginning of your class, you, to enable interrupts, you say to your students, please raise your hand if you have a question. OK, that's what you put in your setup routine at the beginning of your program for the day. OK, then you go into the void loop where you repeat things monotonously for the rest of your career. Um, wait, no, positive, stay positive. <laughs> OK, interrupt, uh, interrupt the regular operation of your code. So you're going on in your class and a student puts their hand up. And uh, I don't know why I'm putting my hand up right now. I'm talking to a computer screen. And uh, the student puts their hand up. And all of a sudden, you stop the regular execution of your lesson. And you say, aha, an interrupt has occurred. And you go to your interrupt handling routine. And you ask the student why they put their hand up. And they say they want to go to the bathroom. And you say, no, you went to the bathroom 30 seconds ago. And you've handled the interrupt. And you return to your regular uh, uh, regular lesson. Uh, so uh, now in the Arduino, it's uh, something like that. In your setup routine, you enable the interrupts. You say what ha you want to happen when an interrupt gets triggered. And you have to keep that interrupt handling routine fairly quick. Never, ever, ever put a delay statement or anything like that into an interrupt handling routine. OK, it's a, that's a rule. You can break it uh, at your choice. But you want these interrupt handling routines to be very quick, maybe uh, 10 commands, you know, uh, unless you really know what you're doing. So interrupts can be triggered by a couple of things. One of those are timers, and we haven't really talked about those yet. They're internal to the Arduino, and you've used them. You just didn't know that you were using them uh, when we were using the servo library and things like that. There's also what we're going to be using today is the external interrupts. And that's the digital high and low signals that come to pin 2 and pin 3. And they're used to trigger interrupts. The interrupt on pin 2 is known as interrupt 0. And the interrupt on pin 3 is interrupt 1. And those are the only two pins on the Arduino Uno that can trigger an external interrupt. Uh, I lie a little bit, 
but uh, for our purposes, that's good enough. So we've got a few different states that can trigger these interrupts. Uh, whenever that pin is low, you can have an interrupt trigger. Now you've got to be careful with that because if you only watch for when the pin is low, well, every time it's low and for as long as it stays low, it will trigger an interrupt. So you'll just keep bouncing back to the interrupt. So generally I try to stay away from looking at low. What I tend to look for is either a rising edge or a falling edge. And that's where you're transitioning from low to high or when you're transitioning from high to low. So you catch that transition, which is really what we're looking for with our encoder. And if you want to watch for transitions in either direction, you can watch for the change. So uh, a rising is when the signal goes from low to high, falling when you go from high to low, and change means either one of them is happening. So let's take a look at this uh, in action for a little bit. Okay, uh, here we go right here. Now in this code right here, and uh, sorry, that's about as big as I can make it on this uh, screen right here. So I'll just go through it uh, fairly carefully. We've got our setup routine, and this is the critical command that I've got set up right here. Attach interrupt with a capital I for interrupt. And I'm attaching it to the interrupt numbered zero because my line is connected to pin two right here. Okay, I am going to run the function called change LED whenever I see that signal falling. So when I see this pin right here transition from high to low, my regularly operating program in here is going to stop what it's doing. It's going to kick out right here. It is going to run this routine in here, which is going to change the state of this red LED and then it's going to kick right back into here. Okay, so you'll notice that at no point in my loop do I read pin 2, and at no point in my loop do I write to pin 10. However, when we run the code, we're going to read pin 2 because in the background, the Arduino is going to be listening to pin 2, and when it sees that signal fall, it's going to run this routine for me. Something to note is that uh, pin mode 2 right here, uh, when we set our pin mode, we're setting it to an input pull-up right here so that uh, I have that pull-up resistor internal to the at mega chip holding this high until I push the switch and drag it low. Let's start the simulation and see what happens. Okay, so right now you can see that the built-in LED right here down here on the, uh, right on the board is blinking because this routine is running right in here and this is just standard blink routine. It's sitting here going around like this with not a care in the world. Now when I press this button right here that is going to connect pin 2 to ground causing a falling signal and when I let up on it that stays red. Okay, Because what happened was when it detected interrupt zero okay on pin two with a falling signal it came and it ran the change led routine it took a look here it did a quick read to see what the state of pin 10 was it said oh 10 pin 10 was low so that wasn't true so it came down here and it wrote it and made it high so now if i come and click on this one again okay it comes down here runs this routine it says oops it was high i changed the state and as quickly as i click on that button i can change the state of that red led and what's really neat is that this happens almost instantaneously the arduino can be in the middle of a delay routine right here and when i press that button that command stops comes down here executes this and then it comes back here so I can be at like uh, 200 milliseconds into my delay and it'll pop down here it'll run this and it'll come back and I'll still be 200 milliseconds into my delay so it's a really good way to get responsive interface into your program uh, because that means that 
you know, just like little Johnny in your class can uh, raise his hand and ask to go to the bathroom and get some immediate attention. Uh, on here, you're getting immediate attention regardless of whether or not you're in some kind of endless loop of lecturing. I've never been there. Okay, let's come on over here and let's take a look at an encoder hooked up to an Arduino. Okay, and this one right here is good, hooked up and ready to go. Let's see, which one is this? This is pulse counting. Okay, and I need to see the code for this one. There we go, thank you. And I want the serial monitor. All right, so what we've got happening here is uh, right up at the top, I've got a variable called encoder ticks. And because that's going to be a fairly large number eventually, and it's never going to be negative, uh, because I've on I'm only using this as a simple encoder, I'm only taking a look at the encoder A channel, uh, I've made it an unsigned variable because it's never going to be negative. So this is going to have values between like 0 and 65,000. And so I set that up with zero. Here's my setup routine. Uh, now pin five and six are set up to be my outputs because they're driving the L293D chip, which we took a look at in a previous video. And the L293D comes down here and it controls the motor negative and the motor positive. So by changing the state of pins five and six, I can change the direction of the motor. By changing the duty cycle, the pulse width modulation heading to pin 5 or to pin 6, I can change the speed of the motor. So if we zoom in right here on the motor, you can see that the motor right here is going in reverse. It's got negative on there, 25, 26, 27. So it is speeding up as we go along through this. Now the other thing that you can see on here is that I've got an oscilloscope. And the oscilloscope comes right down here and it is looking at channel B on the encoder as it spins around right there. And as the uh, motor speeds up, you can see that those pulses get closer and closer and closer together. Now, all uh, an oscilloscope is is a graph of the signal. So this is time along the bottom right here and it's 10 milliseconds. And what you're seeing is these pulses get closer and closer together there's more of them, meaning that they're happening faster, which means that the motor is spinning faster right now. When the motor gets through that cycle and it gets as fast as it's going to go, it's uh, actually going to slow down and stop. Poof, there we go. And now it takes a long time for those pulses to come together. And now they start getting faster and faster and faster as the motor approaches its peak speed. Let's take a look at the code and see what it's doing over here. So here's our attach interrupt command that we put into the setup routine. We're enabling interrupts. We're saying to the uh, Arduino, the equivalent of saying to class, is put up your hands if you have a question. In here, we're saying if you see a rising signal on uh, channel zero so that's uh, d2 right there if you see a rising signal then i want you to come down here and run this interrupt handler now this is a very simple interrupt handler all it says is encoder ticks equals encoder ticks plus one so it just adds one to the number so each time we see a pulse like that come into the arduino we just add one to the variable encoder ticks Right in here, uh, when we're uh, looping around right in here, we print that variable out, encoder ticks, and you can see that appearing in our serial monitor down at the bottom. And I'm just going to stop our simulation here for a second. And what you can see is uh, that uh, we're keeping track of the count. Now you'll notice that sometimes the count skips. We don't uh, see every pulse being printed out in here. Well, that's because we're catching every pulse, we're seeing every pulse, we're counting all of them, but we only do this print once every 20 milliseconds. And even this print statement is going to take a millisecond or two because, uh, you know, it takes time to do a serial print. So during this segment right here, we're going count, 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 print, count, 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 print. And so that's why we're seeing 
these numbers go up more than one at a time. We're adding one at a time, but this delay and time in printing back here means that we don't uh, uh, that we don't see uh, every number showing up right in here. So there we go. So you know, since we started that little routine, it's gone 23,945 ticks. 23,962 ticks. So we're usually seeing about, what's that, 15, 17, looks pretty standard, about 17 pulses per tick. And as the motor speeds up, that number should change. Okay, so, uh, so cool. We're taking a look at that. Now let's skip over uh, one more circuit right here. And this one does things a little bit fancier. Uh, again, it's running here. We've just got the one interrupt uh, hooked up right in here. And you can see those pulses are coming closer together. And this time we're monitoring not just the number of ticks. You can see that number going up. But we're seeing how long it takes in between those ticks. So let's take a, let's stop the simulation right here. And I'm just going to drag this uh, serial monitor down so we can see all of the code. So now I'm keeping track of a couple of other things in here. So uh, I've still got my unsigned int encoder ticks. That was just like in the uh, last one. I'm using that to count how far we've gone. I've got an unsigned long of my last tick time and an unsigned long of my last pulse time. Now we'll take a look at what those do in just a moment. But since we're going to use them in conjunction with the micros function, just like if we were using millis or micros, because those can become really big numbers, we need to give them a really big variable space. So we use the unsigned long, unsigned because we haven't figured out a way to get negative time yet, and long because uh, we want to be able to count into the billions with this uh, variable. Okay, uh, so what we're going to do with them is when our interrupt triggers, this is the interrupt code right down here, encoder A is going to do just like it did before. It's going to increase the encoder ticks. And then what we're going to do is we're going to calculate pulse time, which is how long it has taken since the last time we saw a pulse come through here. We're going to measure that in microseconds. So in order to do that, we have to know the last time that this function was called. So we use a variable to keep track of that. And we do that by using the variable last tick time. So right here, I should have called it last pulse time. Sometimes I call them encoder pulses. Sometimes I call them encoder ticks. So right here, we've got the last tick time right here. We set that equal to micros. Now keep in mind, micros is the Arduino's internal uh, timer counting the number of microseconds since the Arduino started up. It will eventually overflow and reset and that could cause a problem in your code, but uh, unless you're going to be running for, you know, a couple of days, it's not going to be a big problem for us. Okay, so our last tick time is going to equal micros right here. So after this comes and runs, last tick time says, okay, the last time this happened to me was 500 microseconds after the program started running. Then we come up here and run things, and we're in the middle of our code right here. It senses another pulse. It comes down here, adds that pulse to the total, and that says, okay, well, how long has it taken for a uh, since the last pulse, it says, well, the current time is micros. Oh, we're at 600 microseconds now. Last tick time happened at 500 microseconds. So pulse time is going to equal 100 microseconds from the last pulse to the current pulse. And now we say, okay, now take that 600 and pop it into last tick time and go back and carry on with the code. So as this runs, you can see that as the motor speeds up, our last pulse time keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller <clears throat> because those pulses get closer and closer together. And so we start off uh, with 2,000 microseconds or 2 milliseconds, but by the time we're uh, speeding up down here, we're down to 1,700 microseconds. And you can see the number of pulses. So this tells us how far we've gone, and this tells us how fast we're going at each stage. Of course, now the reason that it keeps going faster 
as it runs along right here is I've got this for loop right in here. And uh, what the for loop is doing, well, we just take our duty cycle for pin five and we start at zero and we ramp it up to 255, which is the maximum value you can put into analog write because that's the maximum value you can put into a byte. So uh, there we go. We've got a brief introduction to uh, interrupts, which are an absolutely amazing, hugely powerful programming tool. You can dig yourself into a deep hole with interrupts if you don't use them carefully, but use them wisely and they can be an amazing resource. Now, there are libraries out there to help you uh, write this code onto your Arduino, but the Tinkercad uh, uh, libraries do not include um, an encoder library. So if you're writing this for your own Arduino, then you can definitely download an encoder library and use that. And there are tips and techniques that you can use to get an encoder library into the uh, Tinkercad simulator. But honestly, you don't have to do that. Once you get the uh, basics of how an interrupt works, you can write your own uh, uh, encoder handling routines and you can monitor speed and distance and work it right into your program the way you want it to work. So uh, so there we go. <clears throat> We've got uh, uh, the libraries do ha have a few other benefits to it but uh, there we go. We've got an oscilloscope showing us what's going on with our code. We can see those pulses getting closer and closer together. We can see the rotation of our motor right in here. And uh, <clears throat> you should be able to take this and determine, uh, you know, set your motor to run at a specific speed, find out what your pulse time is. You should be able to control the speed of your motor. Watch how many ticks it takes for your motor to go around once. You should be able to make your motor travel a certain number of ticks. Hook up the quadrature encoder. You should be able to make it move a certain number of ticks forward, a certain number of ticks backwards, and you should be able to control your position and your speed really well. Have a great day.